The Foreseen Arcade. Active. With my recent work on the Sega Saturn Magazine video, all the research gave me the inspiration to explore more magazines and such. And no, the Sega Saturn Magazine video is not a top 10 or a bottom 10 video. It's just the way I organize them. As such, I decided to go for the next console to look into. The Nintendo GameCube. This idea came about while I was playing games as part of a GameCube launch event on Retro Achievements, where you scored points for beating or mastering the game's achievement sets. I did manage to get enough points for the gold medal, which is something to be proud of if I do say so myself. All this gave me an idea to make the magazine video, taking a look at a publication that isn't talked about as much in the retro gaming scene and going over some of their least impressive games they reviewed. Today's magazine in question is Tube Magazine a British magazine that ran for 52 issues from 2001 to 2005. And if I know them for one thing before doing this video, is that they gave out CDs to activate some cheats in games. Not that I will even recommend using cheats in games. I originally planned to set the maximum score to 5.0 out of 10, with the reasoning being somewhat similar to what I said in a Sega Saturn magazine video, but after I spoke to Tesseracti on Discord, I decided to lower that to 4.0 out of 10. As such, the number of games that made it to the criteria went down from the planned 44 games to a much more manageable 15 games. Though I will have to remove Pokemon Box, Ruby and Sapphire as it's more of a utility than an actual game, so this makes it 14 games in total. But it'll still be a fun learning experience nonetheless. So with that out of the way, the Foreseen Arcade is proud to present Cube Magazine's Worst Rated Games. Let's begin with the games that got a perfectly rounded 4.0 rating. In fact, 7 games in total got a 4.0 rating. And there's no better way to start off this video than with a game from Acclaim. Legends of Wrestling 2 was developed by Acclaim's Salt Lake City Studio, also known as Sculptured Software. In fact, it was their final game they would ever develop before they were shut down in December of 2002, one month after the game's North American release. The game itself lets you play as one of the 65 famous champions, such as Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Rowdy Roddy Piper, Bruno San Martino, Brett Hitman Hart, Sid Vicious, Big Papa Pump Scott Steiner, and Jerry the King Lawler. If you don't fancy any of them, you can always make your own champion using a Create a Legend feature, which is expanded from the first game. Biron Wilkinson gave us a single page review on the 15th issue of Cube, who began by mentioning that Cube magazine gave the game's predecessor a paltry 4.7 out of 10 on issue 7. It's safe to say that things did not improve as he wrote the game is plodding, lacks fun, requires little skill, and offers no real incentive for continued play. He also goes on to criticize the game's scrappy collision detection and the lack of immersion. He wraps it up by saying that while his review was not from a point of view of a wrestling fan, but then, whatever you think of men in tights, Legend of Wrestling 2 is painfully bad. The Cube Verdict described the game as yet another wrestling game to forget about, and the subtitle under the final score of 4.0 states that Legends of Wrestling 2 is at its best with your GameCube turned off. According to Moby Games, the GameCube version of Legends of Wrestling 2 got an average score of 63% based on 9 archived ratings. 
The lowest score comes from GameSpy for the GameCube version, as they gave it a 2 out of 5, which is lower than the PlayStation 2 and Xbox versions. The reason behind this was because due to the game's tiny disc size, the GameCube version omits the interviews, alongside the system's persistent slowdown. Gaming Target, on the other hand, gave the GameCube version a 7.5 out of 10, while PGNX Media gave it a 7.3 out of 10, stating that it's another decent attempt by Acclaim. It doesn't improve on the original too much, especially in the gameplay. The game is extremely fun in multiplayer mode, and there are many legends included. This is definitely a rental, and depending on your experience, maybe a purchase. Next up is Godzilla Destroy All Monsters Melee, published by Infograms, now going under the Atari name, and developed by Pipeworks Software. You get to choose from a host of classic Godzilla monsters, including 90s and 2000s versions of the beast himself, plus Megalon, Angurios, King Ghidorah, Gigan, Rodan, Mecha King Ghidorah, Destroyer, and Mega Godzilla. Aliens have invaded the Earth, you see, bringing with them a collection of deadly monsters bent on the destruction of the land they stand on. In adventure mode, you must destroy each of the beasts and send the aliens packing home, while also looking after yourself from the humans who all want the beasts dead. Funnily enough, this is one of the two GameCube games on this video that actually has a set on retro achievement, and as part of our system rollout, no less. Will Johnston did the review for issue 13, as while he did like the idea behind a game where you get to take the reins of the fairly famous Toho monster and duke it out in a major city, he wrote that it's the one idea that is destroyed with such ferocity that it scares them. He goes on to say that the beasties are animated like they've just had a 10 course meal of solid concrete, and the only satisfaction you get from seeing a building collapse is in the relief you feel because you can now see more what is meant to be going on. I mean, I get that the monsters themselves are hardly agile in the first place, but to him, that's no excuse for translating that fact into a poor gameplay mechanic. The Cube Verdict praised the game's originality, since you don't get to see games like this on the GameCube often, but it does state that it may be worth playing it for a long time if you have a thing for the whole, while the rest of the GameCube owners, at least those in the UK, will be returning it to the shop pronto. The Verdict rounds off the game with a 4.0 out of 10, stating that with a bit more grace and some real point of a destruction, this could have been a contender. Looking at its reviews on Moby Games, the game actually got an average score of 70%, at least on GameCube, based on 18 ratings. The highest score comes from IGN, who gave it an 8.4 out of 10. GameZone gave it an 8.1 out of 10, stating that even though there are some bad things about this game, it creates a new fighting experience that many games like it have not yet done. The graphics are great, and the gameplay, though a little sluggish, is just plain fun. If you are a Godzilla fan, or have lots of friends that like video games, this is a great game to have. The lowest score for the GameCube version comes from Jillvideo.com, who gave it a 7 out of 20. Their summary, when translated to English, states that it is clear that this title plays the second degree card to the full. Second degree in combat, second degree in the choice of creatures, second degree in sound effects. It's a shame that the price is not also secondary, because there's already nothing to laugh about. The note is to be taken seriously. Next, we have an updated, reimagined version of a classic arcade game, Defender. Published in 2002 by Midway, 
This was developed by Seven Studios, who also developed Legion, The Legend of Excalibur, Napoleon Dynamite, The Game, and two games based on the Fantastic Four movies. With a total of six different ships to fly, each with its own flight characteristics and special weapons, your task is to help save the remaining colonists and destroy the Manti Bugs, who are hell-bent on destroying the human race after their invasion of planet Earth. Gary Adams reviewed this game on issue 17, who starts off with this paragraph. Imagine sitting in a square grey room. The walls are grey, the floor is grey, and the ceiling is grey. There is a table in the middle of a room. It is grey. On top of this table is a grey piece of paper, and written on it in a slightly darker shade of grey, a plan of the Manchester bus routes. Emitting from some hidden speaker is the sound of a saxophone that's capable of producing only one note. You are wearing a grey shell suit. The only way of escaping is to memorize what's on the piece of paper. Sound all? Try playing Defender. He does say that at first it looks promising, being that it is based on the old arcade game, as the reimagining features six ships, the levels are quite large and there are plenty of them, you can buy weapon upgrades and there's even a feint with of real-time strategy elements in there. The problem, according to Gary, was that everything is so, well, dull. You start off doing training missions where you fly through hoops and learn the ropes of saving the colonists. He certainly did praise the fact that the colonists he rescued now actually create ground units such as missile launchers and tanks which you can move around at your leisure. The problem with this is that the controls are over demanding. The boost and break actions being mapped to a single shoulder button is an interesting idea where you hold up to the click to accelerate while pushing all the way to stop but targeting a specific enemy is a pain as it is so easy to overcompensate and end up shooting wildly in a wrong direction. Or worse, a colonist you were supposed to rescue. It's especially bad when you try playing the game using that default control scheme on a dolphin emulator, as there is no way I could beat the tutorial before switching the scheme. He went on to criticize the game's narrative for being boring, the graphics looking like an old PC game, the juddery FMV, the story being a no-brainer, and the fiddly control, concluding that Defender for the GameCube totally lacks in excitement and soul. The Cube verdict, despite praising the game's lifespan and originality, suggested that the better alternative for GameCube owners is Star Wars The Clone Wars, which they gave it a 6.7 out of 10 in issue 13, as it is the same style of gameplay, but with a more familiar license and more varied challenges. And not to mention it is available as part of a PlayStation Plus Premium Catalog, if you're interested. The verdict is a 4.0 out of 10, describing Defender to be as dull, uneventful, and difficult to control as one of Miles' special parties. Speaking of Miles, he gave a second opinion on the verdict, stating that dredging up an old crusty name to sell a few games on the back of a retro tip is insipid enough, but putting out something this chronic is unforgivable. Cube Magazine's 4.0 rating is definitely the lowest rating for this one, as the score for the GameCube version is actually lower than the review from Nintendo World Report, who gave it a 6 out of 10. The GameCube version itself has an average score of 72% on Moby Games, with Gaming Target once again giving it the highest rating of 8.8 .8 out of 10. Blood Rain is next to get the 4.0 rating from Cube Magazine. Published by Majesco and developed by Terminal Reality, you take control of the titular half-vampire Blood Rain, 
as she clears out the walking dead and man-sized insects in the swamps of Louisiana to hunting down members of the secretive Gegengeist group branch of the Nazi military around the world as well as the monsters they unwittingly awakened. This is another review written by Gary Adam as he took a look at Blood Rain as part of issue 19. He wrote that it's probably a good thing Blood Rain is about pure violence, slashing zombies, spiders and Nazis into itty bitty pieces and all, because if Terminal Reality couldn't even get the camera, level design and controls right, then the Cube Magazine staff dread to think of what they will have been presented if this had required a little thought. As a matter of fact, Gary doesn't beat around the bush here when he says that Blood Rain is a bore. He went on to criticize the game for its repetitive gameplay, the jerky frame rate, the poor graphics, the music, unconvincing animations, unnecessary childish swearing from Agent Rain herself, the lack of unlockable secrets, and no multiplayer. The verdict even goes as far as to suggest that the better alternative is to get Time Splitters 2 instead. The game wound up with a 4.0 out of 10, as the verdict calls it a dull, tired game that relies on cheap thrills to mask its lack of substance. The GameCube version has a 70% average on Bobby Games, with the most positive score coming from GameZone, who gave it an 8.8 .8 out of 10 stating that you are guaranteed to love Blood Rain if you like Onimusha, Devil May Cry, and or Max Payne, and even if you don't like those games, it's still a perfect example of what a third person action game should be. PGNX Media gave it an 8 out of 10, saying that Blood Rain definitely deserves a rental because of its visual effects, and it's definitely a better game than Crystal Dynamics Blood Omen 2. As low as Cube Magazine scored, this is not nearly as low as the review from Just Adventure, who gave it a 25 out of 100, who had this to say. What grates me the most is not the immaturity of the developers because, after all, they're just trying to make a buck by appealing to the lowest common denominator. No, the bigger horse are the professional reviewers who are more than willing to overlook the criticious violence and rapid sexism that is prevalent in too many of today's games as long as they have an enjoyable game experience and don't have to struggle with the controls. But by doing so, they continue to perpetuate the stereotype that most gamers are drooling, owl-brained teenagers content to luxuriate in a sea of sex and violence. Still, if you are curious to try this game, Blood Rain's new IP owner Ziggurat released revamped remasters of this game and its sequel on modern consoles, with PC versions getting the terminal cut upgrades, while the Xbox version of Blood Rain 2 is backward compatible with the Xbox One and Series X and S. We now get to another arcade game that has been reimagined for the GameCube. This time around is Dragon's Lair 3D Return to the Lair. Known in PAL versions as Dragon's Lair 3D Special Edition, it's a cel-shaded reimagining of Don Bluth's 1983 arcade game. Gameplay-wise, it deviates from it significantly, being a fully-fledged action platformer with unrestricted character movement, instead of being an interactive movie like it was back on its Laserdisc arcade game. Dirk has to battle enemies, jump across platforms and hazards, and solve a few puzzles on his way. Health and mana points can be upgraded over the course of the game. Dirk can also use a crossbow to combat enemies and solve some of the puzzles. This was also the only game to be developed by Dragonstone Software. While it was published in North America by Encore, THQ handled its PAL release. Liz Morris was given a chance to review this one and she begins the review with this. 
dear lord, if we had a penny for every crap 3D version of a classic 2D game we've had to play, then we'd have, well, about 18 pens. But the point is still valid. First there was Pac-Man World 2, then Worms 3D, and most recently Sonic Heroes, and now Dragon Slayer 3D has fallen into the trap. It's a simple fact that a successful 2D game isn't going to work in a 3D format unless it's given a serious overhaul, by which point you'd be wondering why don't they just create a totally original game in the first place and stop messing about with the classics. She started things off on a respectful note, saying that Trangle Slayer 3D has really kept the essence of the original 2D counterpart. Not only the story and other elements of the game are incredibly alike, but she also mentions that Dragonstone has clearly made a lot of effort to ensure that all the 43 levels are in keeping with the original. Even some of the 250 rooms are near perfect replicas from those in the original. But for anyone who didn't play the original back then, she wrote that the 3D translation did not hold up in today's world, calling it possibly one of the most frustrating and disappointing games Cube staff ever had the misfortune to play. One fatal flaw was the control scheme, which she claims it was clearly cobbled together by some crazed monkey. The second flaw was the fact that Dirk needs to have his sword seized before he can grab onto anything. And then there's the jumping, which is criticized for being too sensitive, as you'll frequently overshoot or undershoot certain leaps, meaning bye bye Dirky and cue hissy fit. Liz also goes a bit overboard, saying that if the Cube magazine staff has to see that stupid death animation one more time, they're going to hunt Don Bluff down and feed him to Singe. The Cube verdict gave it a 4.0 out of a 10, as its closing statement reads, All style and all substance make Dirk a dull boy. Try saying that three times fast. Dragon Slayer 3D's Moby Games review page doesn't have that big of an average score, as it is a 62%, but what's rather fascinating is that the German edition of Cube Magazine gave it a 7.1 out of 10, which is a lot more positive than the UK edition's 4.0 score. The highest score comes from 4player.de, or 4p.spiele magazine, as they give it a 76 out of 100. The lowest recorded review for the game on Moby Games comes from Eurogamer, as they gave it a similar 4 out of 10 score. Developed and published by Natsume as a GameCube exclusive, Metabot Infinity follows Iki as he and his Metabot go to the Total Total Land amusement park to compete in the Meta Fighter race. Along with the Adventure Mode, an Arena Mode lets you fight against either the computer or another player, as well as the ability to unlock secret characters by hooking up either Metabot's MetaB or Rokusho editions via the GBA link cable. Another review by Liz Morris, this time from issue 38, she says that Metabots, for all its appeal, is essentially Pokemon with robots. It's an okay idea, but she wrote that the Metabots games haven't seen the same level of success as the Pokemon series, and sadly, Infinity did not break that cycle. It all sounded good in theory, as you can customize your own Metabots and create a new arena. You can also download Metabots from the GBA Metabot games, but the execution left a lot to be desired. She criticized the shoddy graphics, appalling music, the camera defying any rational reasoning, and the lack of a targeting system. In order to progress through the game, you have to clear all arenas in the park, with each arena being based on different themes and full of hazards, enemies, puzzles, and traps. The Cube Verdict described the audio as it sounds like something you'd hear on Art Attack, the game's originality being basically Bionicle meets Custom Robo, and stating that the lifespan depends on how masochistic you are. 
along with a 4.0 out of 10 rating. The conclusion reads that the concept of robo battles, customizing metabots, and collecting and exchanging meta parts are okay, but the actual game lacks depth. It's badly executed, tedious, and a horrendous camera totally ruins what fun you might have had. It makes you wonder what Natsume was trying to achieve. Is it an RPG? Is it an action game? Either way, it doesn't work. Only two reviews of this game were ever archived on mobile games. GameSpot gave it a 5.4 out of 10, while N Europe gave it a 3 out of 10, with the latter stating that if you're a fan of Metabots, stick with the cartoon or happily play Pokemon and name one of your Pokemon Metabot. The latter option being a simple solution, it'll help you avoid playing this rather under average game. Our last 4.0 rated game is the THQ published Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius, based on a theatrical film of the same name. This was developed by Big Sky Interactive, whose only other game they developed before they shut down was SpongeBob SquarePants Revenge of a Flying Dutchman. The game is a collectathon platformer with minigames, which somewhat follow the events of the Nickelodeon movie. I do find it interesting that not only you can unlock the clips from the movie, but also the shorts that aired on Nickelodeon at the time. Gary Adams reviewed Jimmy Neutron's first GameCube outing on issue 18, stating that the game is as daring and innovative as buying a loaf of bread. There is nothing that jumps out, grabs you, and refuses to let you leave until you've satisfied your gaming first. He was talking about collectible items, in this case Neutrons, 10 of which will grant you an extra life. The game started out promising for Gary as the fairground part had some varied challenges and is quite good fun, but after that the game soon degenerated into typical platforming fare, and before you know it you're turning off your TV off and flirting with the idea of going outside, or as the internet calls it, touching grass. The problems he criticized the game for include the dullness of the game, the scrappy presentation, the lack of focus, and especially the controls. He wrote that the camera is fixed, causing you to misjudge your jump at an alarming rate, and it's also zoomed in too close most of the time, so you can't take in any of the levels. He also criticized the level design of the areas as quite simple, and when there are mazes to traverse, they're normally too fiddly for their own good. He caps the review off stating that it was a shame it turned out the way it did, as it's a good license with plenty of potential. The Cube Verdict described the visuals as looking like a 5 year old PC game in high resolution, describing the game to be about as original as an old teen cast horror movie, and the lifespan bit says that when you sit down with this game for a day, you'll be done by dinner. The verdict gave this movie tie-in a 4.0 out of 10, stating that Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius for the GameCube will only appeal if you're desperate for a platformer at any cost. According to Moby Games, there are 5 reviews that were archived for the GameCube version, all of which were middling. Only 2 of them were in English, with Tech TV giving it a 2 out of 5, while N Files gave it a 3.5 out of 10. Funnily enough, the PlayStation 2 version was given a 7.7 .7 out of 10 from PlayStation Revista Oficial, which is essentially a Spanish edition of the official UK PlayStation magazine, whose conclusion translates to <coughs> The most valuable thing about the game is its extra. It has an attractive gameplay due to its great variety of styles but its graphics and the fact that it does not have voices in Spanish spoils a good license. Hey, Dios mio. 
Batman Dark Tomorrow was already a terrible game, be it on the GameCube or on the original Xbox. While Hot Gen had assisted in making the Xbox port, the game itself was developed by Camco. It was initially pitched as an open world Batman game, a full console generation before Rocksteady Studios Arkham series, but after being stuck in development hell, which even led to the cancellation of a planned PlayStation 2 version, this ended up being a massive disappointment. Gary Adams, who did write the review on issue 20, starts off by pointing out that Batman Dark Tomorrow was supposed to be released in September of 2001 as part of a GameCube's launch lineup. The first problem he mentioned is the interaction with the environments, as their blurriness means you're never quite sure just where you can go. The biggest flaw with Dark Tomorrow is how frustrating it can get, thanks to its fiddly controls, awkward mechanics, the terrible camera, the difficulty and the flow of a game. He finally batcuffs the game review by stating that for a game that has been in development for so long, Dark Tomorrow is a huge disappointment. As the Cube magazine staff were hoping for a scrolling beat-em-up on the GameCube, which we don't see much nowadays, only to end up with a messy, clumsy title that is not worth playing thus ending up with a 3.9 out of 10. And you know something ain't right when the cube verdict recommends you you play Blood Rain instead, and they gave it a 4.0 out of 10 rating one issue earlier. If you want to know just how bad it is, if this hadn't convinced you yet, then check out ReRes's Just Bad Games episode on this one. Seriously, I won't even bother with the archive reviews on Moby Games. This one is a double feature, as both games got the 3.8 rating on Cube Magazine. One is a port of an arcade game, and the other is a movie tie-in. Galeco's arcade game, Smashing Drive, puts you in the driver's seat of an insane, outrageous taxi on the busy streets of New York City. Your job is to simply race from point to point in the fastest time possible. The key to success in Smashing Drive lies in two features, crazy power-ups and hidden shortcuts. Almost all the power-ups transform your taxi in some way that allows you to smash your way through the traffic with ease, and the shortcuts usually involve crashing through the insides of buildings, like movie theaters and sports arenas. The GameCube port was released two years after the original arcade release, with Namco serving as the publisher, while Point of View was given the rights to develop the port. Chandra Nair wrote a four-page long review for issue 5, which is quite a lot for an arcade port, of what's basically Namco's first offering for the GameCube, and honestly, it's a shocker. Even more so, considering that Namco didn't have much to do with the Nintendo 64, alongside the Triforce arcade collaboration with Nintendo and Sega. As he writes in his review, the game attempts to build on a tried and tested formula of Midway's Rush Games and Sega's Crazy Taxi, as you drive madly around traffic congested streets, using jumps, shortcuts and raw momentum to ram your way through. The game also gives you damage, repairs, and power-ups, like the supersonic horn, which works like this. As you get to the destination, racing against your opponent, you can also drive up to the side of a building for a hidden shortcut. Come to think of it, it kinda reminds me of Geico's earlier arcade game Radical Bikers, but even more chaotic. The problem he found though, is that this is a direct port. He writes that the game was lazy enough to remind himself that this is a GameCube game, and not a Nintendo 64 game. The other severe problem was that the game can be beaten in 40 minutes and you don't even get an ending. The fact it retailed at 60 pounds did not help matters. 
The verdict provides a comment for the game's audio, stating that someone actually got paid to come up with four terrible compositions, which then they suggest that they blame the parents for this one. Smashing Drive was given a 3.8 out of 10, with the summary stating that it's fun for 10 minutes, if your eyes are closed. The consensus on Moby Games is on the average of 47%, with most scores being 50% at best. Consoles Plus gave it an 82 out of 100, whose translated summary states that Smashing Drive will entertain the wildest of them, but disappoint those who like clear and precise games. Both Game Informer Magazine and Gaming Target gave it a 7 out of 10, being the most positive out of the English reviews for the GameCube version. The review that was much more harsh than the Cube magazine comes from GameCritics.com, who gave it a 2 out of 10, whose conclusion reads as follows. Bottom line, don't waste your time, money or electricity by trifling with this piece of sorry software. I can see absolutely no reason why Namco would bother putting out something of such dubious quality except to cash in on GameCube owners starved for new titles. Come to think of it, I don't understand why Nintendo would even approve it for release. Do yourself a favor and spend your money on anything else. Taking a taxi ride down to return or exchange Smashing Drive will be more fun than playing it. The other game on this segment is The Polar Express, based on a motion captured animated movie of the same name. Published by THQ, this was developed by Blue Tongue Entertainment, the studio that's best known for developing Jurassic Park Operation Genesis, Nictus Unite, and both The Blob 1 and 2. You take control of Chris, the film's main protagonist, and make your way to the North Pole on the Polar Express, helping the other kids to overcome the hazards and villains on the way to meet Santa in person. Ryan King reviewed this for issue 40, where he starts off by saying that you can justify the existence of almost anything with those magic words. It's for kids. Examples being Dick and Dom, S Club Juniors, Harry Potter, and in this case, the Polar Express. It's for kids, so that means it's stupidly easy to complete, has almost no gameplay, and lasts slightly longer than a sneeze. Because kids like that, don't they? Well, if you ask me, that will be a yes if you believe kids actually enjoy the insipid brain rot we have nowadays, like Cockamelon, Teen Titans Go, Peppa Pig, some family-friendly app formerly called Twitter, but Ryan is more realistic on the matter with one single word. Rubbish. He writes that just because kids are small and annoying, it doesn't mean they should automatically be excluded from the gaming joys of games like Super Mario Sunshine or Beyond Good and Evil. His rant makes a point that such excuse like this lower than that, as this is for the kids who will find even those games complicated, with the gameplay being so simplistic it borders on offensive. After finishing his rant, he goes to review the game properly, criticizing the game for its insultingly basic gameplay, the poor job of even selling the movie to the kids, and such and not to mention the game's 40 quid price tag. He also goes out to say that this is possibly the only game where it's actually possible to browse the internet at the same time as playing. The Cube verdict gave the game a 3.8 out of 10, stating the game is short, silly, slow, and stupid. The conclusion reads as follows. Making games patronizingly easy and short isn't how you get kids to put down their bottle of Panda Pops and pick up a pad. Instead, you need accessible gameplay that's engrossing and fun and lasts longer than a rainy afternoon. The film license provides movie footage, 
but that doesn't save the Polar Express where the gameplay fails. And Tom Hanks isn't even in it, it's his brother doing the voice. Anyway, on Moby Games, the GameCube version has a 44% average. GameZone gave it a 7.2 out of 10, and it's the only positive review for the GameCube version. In fact, three publications gave it slightly lower scores than Cube Magazine. Jeuxvideo.com gave it a 7 out of 20, IGN gave it a 35 out of 10, and GameSpot gave it a 3.1 out of 10. GameSpot in particular says that the Polar Express really feels like a soulless video game cash-in on a movie. And frankly, given I played it when I was capturing the footage, it's easy to see why this is a train you'd be better off missing, regardless of who you are. Another game that got a set for the GameCube rollout on retro achievements, we have Universal Studios Theme Parks Adventures. The second game in the video that's brought to us by Camco, but unlike Batman Dark Tomorrow, they're only publishing the game this time. This game was developed by Naya Digital Works, which is also their only game they ever worked on. The game is essentially a minigame collection where you explore the 3D reconstruction of Universal Studios Japan, where you can spend a day at the park and ride the many rides and see the attractions that are part of a real life studios. To take part in each ride, you must find and complete a range of tasks, with cartoon great Woody Woodpecker helping you out. Once you complete a task, one of the many rides will be available to ride for free. You can also redeem points to purchase hats, which lets you access minigames based on a specific ride at any time. As you go along, you will also come across many characters and other situations to get involved in, and you can meet up with Winnie Woodpecker to complete a trivia quiz with questions based on the history of Universal Pictures. Martin Mifers had the misfortune of reviewing this one in issue 3, and 4 pages long at that, as he starts off by saying the idea of bringing a theme park into a video game should be enough to start ringing alarm bells. While games like Theme Park, Roller Coaster Tycoon and even Legoland taking the management approach is all well and good, making it a theme park simulator where you have to spend time in the park like in the real life, well that's exactly the premise that Universal Studios Theme Park's adventure offers on a platter filled with stinky fish, useless dinosaurs, and a Back to the Future experience that'll have you wishing they'd never invented time travel. Unless, of course, if it's to slip Marty McFly some 50 bucks to travel back in time to convince Kemco to cut their losses and just cancel the game outright. To say it falls flat on its ass would be a severe understatement, as the minigames were dreadful. The best of the minigames was the one based on Backdraft, as you run around the burning building, rescuing civilians and putting out fires within a time limit. The Wild 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 West minigame was a missed opportunity as it doesn't support the light gun. Jaws has you throwing garbage at the titular Jaws while bashing it on the nose to prevent sinking. E.T. had you riding a bike over obstacles before the time runs out and the Jurassic Park minigame was a rail shooter as you pummel the A button to blow up badly animated dinosaurs. And the less we speak of Back to the Future the right, the better. As for the quiz with Winnie Woodpecker, most of the questions are tough as they are all about Universal movies stretching as far as some of the most obscure films like Out of Africa. So unless you are a living, breathing, universal encyclopedia, or just a movie buff in general, you're practically screwed. He wrote that just watching the game makes you wonder if Kemco or Naya Digital Works actually developed it on a GameCube development kit, or simply used some kind of Fisher-Price playset to program the game before burning it into several hundred CDs. 
The Cube verdict states that the Cube magazine staff will make a comment about the gameplay, but they won't even find any, even after scraping the barrel dry. The verdict gave this game a 3.7 out of 10, as this is worth paying the full price of 40 quid if you feel like you want to have your own intelligence insulted on purpose. What's even more shocking is that the game still has a better Moby score than Batman Dark Tomorrow, also published by Chemco. And believe it or not, GameSpy gave it a 60 out of 100, making it the most positive review this game ever got. Not that it's saying much about the game itself anyway. The absolute war score comes from the video game critic, who gave it a 0% in their retro review in 2006, complete with this mouthful of a summary. Who designed this thing? You can stop and talk to people, but it's pointless as they just utter rubbish like hello and this is exciting. Exciting? What game are they playing? There's also an idiotic movie trivia game which offers really bad multiple choice decisions about inconsequential films like Dragonheart, Patch Adams and Back to the Future Part 3. Due to a bug in the game, occasionally the choices aren't even displayed on a screen. Universal Studios Theme Park's adventure is an absolute travesty. The video game equivalent of raw sewage. I'm usually quite amused when I review bad games, but this one just left me feeling disgusted. Blech. Urban Freestyle Soccer, known in the US as Freestyle Street Soccer, is the second sports game by Acclaim to make it on a video. Developed by Silicon Dreams and Gosto Games, it is exactly what it says on the box, a freestyle soccer game in an urban setting. The game focuses on action and fun instead of realism. Each player can perform a large variety of moves beyond the typical soccer game moves, such as scissor kicks, mid-air juggles and bicycle kicks. Performing said moves allow you to gain skill points that can be used to unlock new game modes, teams courts and cheats. Next to these special moves, you can also interact with the environment. Your players can pick things up and throw them around or manually hit your opponents. As part of his review on issue 30, Ian criticized the game for the busy screen, inconsistent control scheme, underwhelming special moves, as well as the fact that it's a weak, repetitive attempt at expanding the football genre. Decent sound and animation were not enough to turn an average idea into a good game, which explains its 3.6 out of 10 score. To be honest, let's just say he is not too impressed with this one, so I will just make it a short one from that side. Looking it up on Moby Games, the GameCube version actually has the highest score out of all versions, with a Moby score of 6.1. GameSpot gave its North American release a 3.8 out of 10, stating that while games like EA Street Series and NBA Ballers have proven that street sports can be done right in video games, Freestyle Street Soccer proves that you can also do them very, very wrong. But the most positive review comes once again from Cube Magazine's German counterpart, giving it an 8.1 out of 10. This one is pretty funny. If you remember my Sega Saturn magazine video, GT24 was the only import review to make it to the video. The exact same thing actually happened here, as Dream Mix TV World Fighters is the only GameCube import to appear in this video. Heck, if I kept the original 5.0 out of 10 limit, GT Cube would have been covered in the video too. Dream Mix TV World Fighters is a Smash Brothers clone with an absurd premise. A television program is facing low ratings and they are told by their TV network that they are on the verge of being cancelled. In order to hold on to their jobs, 
the people in charge of a program decide to hold a fighting brawl tournament involving some of Japan's superstars from the licenses of Hudson, Konami, and Takara. The characters that were involved include Solid Snake from Metal Gear Solid, Yugo from Bloody Roar, Bomberman, Optimus Prime and Megatron from Transformers, Twindy, and Castlevania's own Simon Belmont. Although the GameCube version doesn't have a set yet, it does have a retro achievement set for the PlayStation 2 version. Also coming from issue 30, David criticized the game for how blatant of a Smash Brothers clone it is, but not as good. The lack of variety in character moves and the fact that there is no other type of gameplay other than beating the daylights out of your opponents enough to collect the heart that's flying away from them is what David thinks this game can't even redeem itself in. And half the characters presented in the game aren't even that famous to begin with. At least outside of Japan anyway. The Cube verdict gave this import a 3.4 out of 10 stating that while it's a prime slice of Japanese whimsy, it's just a pity it's not fun. Since it is a Japanese import, only two reviews were archived on Moby Games. Nintendo World Report gave it an 8 out of 10, stating that Dreamix TV World Fighters is different enough from Super Smash Bros. Melee and good enough on its own merits to justify a purchase, as long as you have friends. The German version of Cube shares the same 3.4 out of 10 score as the main UK version, so this makes it the lowest rating for this import. And for our final game, we have gone full circle. This game is reviewed on the same issue as Legend of Wrestling 2, basically leading us back to where we started. Published by Activision and developed by Bonkasha Games, Reckless, the Yakuza missions, cast the player as either two members of the Hong Kong police force or as a pair of spies who must put a stop to the Yakuza stranglehold of Hong Kong. There are 10 missions per site, for a total of 20 missions. Missions range from destroying cars, to picking up documents, to rescuing people. What we have here is an updated port of the original Xbox version of Reckless the Yakuza missions. In the GameCube and PlayStation 2 versions, with Broadsword Interactive handling the GameCube port, missions are now ranked based on how quickly they are completed, and fast times reward medals. By completing a bonus objective on hard mode, such as destroying traffic, a bonus mission will be unlocked. Earning a gold medal in a bonus mission will further unlock a cheat code, like unlimited time or low gravity. A free mode is now available too, allowing the player to drive through the city without worrying about the time limit. Finally, two new features have been added to the cars, an adrenaline feature that slows down time and a limited supply of short range missiles. The original Xbox version was well received, given the Moby score of 7.1, with critics overall being at 73%. But the GameCube port was a different story, as it has an average score of 53%. While GameZone gave this version a 7 out of 10, the rest of the archived reviews were mixed at best. But then we get to Cube Magazine UK which in issue 15, Chandra Nair gave it a very scathing beating, criticizing the game's non-existent gameplay the music and sound effects being forgettable and graphics somehow looking worse than Smashing Drive. The Cube verdict gave the game a 2.4 out of 10 making it their lowest score the magazine could ever give. Thank you so much for watching this silly video. If you have any suggestions for any future videos, 
as well as your opinions on the Cube Magazine's reviews and ratings, feel free to leave a comment or two. As always, I'll see you next time on the Foreseen Arcade.